Hello and welcome to Fluids and Electrolytes. In this section here, we're going to talk about some of the body fluids and what they represent and what they're doing in the body and the electrolytes that are going to be present in those fluids and help to maintain some of our body's functions. So let's go ahead and get started and take a look at what our fluid intake and output is composed of. So there's a number of different ways that we can take fluid in and excrete fluid from the body. First of all, we can get fluid in in our fluid intake that we're drinking. So that's the primary way that we're getting fluid into our bodies through our intake of fluid in our water, etc. that we're drinking. We can also get fluid in by way of IV. So an intravenous line would be another way that we can get fluid into the body. We can have fluid absorption, for example, through the gut. So the person is eating and there's a certain amount of fluid in our food that gets absorbed as well. Lots of different ways it can be excreted through the skin, through the lungs, through drainage, through the kidney and through the bowel. We can all have fluid excreted from the body. We'll take a look in a moment at where and how much of that fluid is going out and into some of those different components. But first of all, let's talk a little bit about what our body fluids and water do in the body. They provide transportation of our nutrients to the cells without having blood transporting our nutrients to the cells. We would not be able to get the nutrients where they belong. They would just sit there on the GI tract, wouldn't go anywhere. They carry waste products away from the cell, so the cell produces the waste product, and then the blood comes to the cell, takes the waste product away, the waste product then gets excreted from the body by way of the kidneys or maybe by way of the GI tract. They provide an environment for electrical or electrolyte chemical reactions to occur. So our electrolytes provide chemical reactions that allow the body to have certain functions, to produce certain functions. And water in their body fluid provide that environment, provide that substrate, for those electrolyte chemical reactions to occur. Now this diagram here is showing what our body fluid composition and compartments is. We just use that 60, 40, 20 rule and we say that 60% of the body weight is water. Okay, not, not mass or not uh, uh, percentage of overall body, but body weight. 40% of our body weight is in the intracellular fluids, 20% is in the extracellular fluid. So here's our distribution of body fluids. Again, our total body water, 60%. And we have about two thirds of it in the intracellular fluid, about a third of it in the extracellular fluid. The intracellular fluid, as the name implies, means it's in the cell. Okay, there's only one place it can be, it can be in the cell. However, the extracellular fluid could be in the interstitial space or it could be in the intravascular space. So two different places we could have fluid. We could also have fluid in the lymph system, the synovial fluid, our cerebral spinal fluid, sweat, etc. All those are different places that we have extracellular fluid. So lots of different places we have extracellular. The two big ones are going to be the interstitial area and the intravascular area. However, two-thirds or the greatest majority of the fluid in the patient's body is inside the cell. Now notice these are big numbers here. Okay, about 25 liters, about 15 liters. Now that doesn't mean that we have an overabundance of fluid in the body. In fact, if we lose about 10% of that fluid, the patient's going to become terribly symptomatic. So where does our fluid intake come from? We saw the previous picture that showed a number of different ways we get fluid in and out of the body. So let's take a look at the vast majority of our fluid intake comes from water that comes from beverages. So you're drinking that beverage and you're getting the vast majority of your water. A significant part of our water that we take in comes from food. So there is a certain amount of water that's in a lot of the food that you eat. Okay, so that's going to be 28%. And then water from metabolism accounts for about 8%. So water is the end result of some methods of metabolism. And you saw that when we talked about acid-base balance. Through the carbonic acid equation, we produced water. So that's another way that we can produce water. We can have water intake in the body. Now that's a very small percentage, 8%, and that's pretty static. So that's not something that's going to go up and down to help to compensate when somebody is gaining or losing fluid. On the other hand, where does the water go? So our fluid output, the vast majority, 59%, is water in the urine. So urine output is going to be about 59%. 25% is water evaporated from the skin. Now this may vary a little bit in different climates. If you're a very humid climate, there's going to be less evaporation of water from the skin, so less loss. In a drier climate, 
Since the air is drier, more fluid, more water will evaporate from the skin, and that can actually lead to the patient becoming dehydrated quicker because they're losing more fluid from the skin than they normally would. Next, we have water from the lungs. You notice that's a fairly significant portion here, about 11%. Now, this is talking about somebody who is just sitting around breathing normally. So as you're sitting here and you're breathing normally, well, you maybe you're not. Maybe you're running on a treadmill, okay, which means we would be breathing faster. And the faster you breathe and the deeper you breathe, the more water will be released from the lungs. And in fact, your patient could actually become dehydrated because of a lack of water to or from the lungs and the patient uh, breathing too much out from having hyperventilation. We also have about 5% of our water loss coming from feces. So as a review, to remember this, the greatest quantity of body fluids is contained within the blank, which is called the blank compartment. So the greatest quantity of body fluids is contained within the cells, which is called the blank compartment. What compartment is that? The intra cellular okay within the cells intracellular all you got to look at is the words in the question they give you the definition so intracellular fluid compartment the second largest fluid compartment is known as the blank compartment it refers to all the fluid outside the cells and in fact that would be okay so it's not intracellular therefore it must be extracellular fluid is outside of the cells the extracellular fluid compartment contains two major compartments which is the interstitial and the intravascular our distribution of body fluids is going to change as we age there's going to be different amounts of fluid overall in the body as we age. So we start out and as a child and about 80% of our body weight is going to be fluid. We already said the adult has about 60% and the older adult could have a lot less. So take a look at some of these reasons why the aging population is prone to dehydration. They have a decreased percentage of total body water. We'll look at that in a moment. An increase in adipose and a decrease in our muscle mass, decreased renal function and a decreased thirst perception. So as we go throughout our life, you notice that each one of these, it's like they're filling the body up with water. So the baby's filled up pretty high there. 80% of that baby is water. Now you get to the adult, and it's only about 60% of the adult is water. And now we get to the older adult, and the older adult, we're down into the 45 to 50 range. The ramifications of this are that as we age, and especially in the elderly, they're going to be more prone to developing dehydration and having fluid volume problems. So because their fluid volume is in a lower range normally, if that increases, they could have problems like heart failure. If that decreases, then the patient could develop dehydration very easily since they're starting with less fluid to begin with. Let's flip back to the newborn now. The newborn is 80% fluid, so wouldn't that make sense that, well, geez, boy, the kid's 80% fluid. They could probably lose a lot of fluid before they would become symptomatic and have problems. Well, not true. The newborn is also very prone to fluid loss. Because so much of the body is made up of fluid, even a small change in that fluid could cause the patient to become significantly unstable. So let's take a look at some questions here regarding our intracellular and extracellular compartments and body water. So let's take a look at our first one here. Intracellular body fluid accounts for approximately 40% or two-thirds of our total body water. What do you think? Is that true or false? Well, this question here is going to be false. Well, didn't we say that intracellular body fluid accounts for two-thirds of the total body water? Yes, but it's not 40% of the total body water. It's 40% of the total body weight. Total body water decreases with age. What do you think about that? Well, if you 
answered true, you are correct. Total body water decreases with age. Okay, the interstitial fluid and the intravascular fluid are considered compartments of the intracellular fluid. True or false? <laughs> Now, if you said false, you'd be correct. The interstitial and intravascular fluid are considered components or compartments of the extracellular fluid, not intracellular fluid. Individuals with more body fat have proportionally more total body weight, so they are less likely to become dehydrated. What do you think about that one? If you said false, you are correct. That does not make them less likely to become dehydrated. All right, well, let's take a look at this idea of tonicity. Tonicity refers to the concentration of the fluid. Now, if we're looking at this diagram, let's take the middle one right there, letter B, and it says isotonic solution. Hopefully, this is a review for you of chemistry. But let's take a look at isotonic solution there in the middle. What you see, the circle in the middle of our picture is a cell. And this cell has the same amount of particles inside the cell as there is in the solution outside the cell. That means the fluid will move easily back and forth in and out of the cell. All right, look over to letter A. We have a hypotonic solution. In this situation now, the number of particles inside the cell, inside the circle, is going to be more than the number of particles outside the cell which draws fluid into the cell. Fluid is drawn to where the particles are. So fluid is drawn into the cell, it makes the cell swell. Eventually that cell is gonna swell so much that it bursts. All right, let's take the opposite equation now, the opposite problem, go over to letter C on the right-hand side. Here, our cell does not contain as many particles as are outside the cell. So notice all those particles outside the cell, right? That's gonna suck fluid out of the cell and into that hypertonic solution. So that's gonna dehydrate our cell. Isotonic solutions have the same solute concentration as blood. Think of normal saline as being your gold standard for an isotonic solution. Now, normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride in water. So it's water plus almost 1% of sodium chloride. A hypertonic solution is a solution that has a higher solute concentration than a red blood cell does. A hypertonic solution is a solution that has a higher solute concentration than red blood cells. In other words, that means that this is a concentrated solution. And that concentrated solution is going to suck fluid from outside the vasculature into the vein and make the vasculature expand. So one of the reasons why we might give a hypertonic solution would be to expand the vasculature. Effects of a hypertonic solution on the cell are that we have the solute outside the cell is higher than inside. Water moves from low solute to high solute and the cell shrinks. So our cell shrinks, shrinks, shrinks because of that hypertonic solution, which means the cell isn't going to work as well. Hypotonic solutions, on the other hand, these are solutions that have a lower solute concentration than the blood, and if we inject it into the vein, fluid is going to move out of the vein and into the tissue. The other thing that can happen when we inject a hypotonic solution is the hypotonic solution can move into those red blood cells, make the red blood cells swell, and possibly burst. So the effects of a hypotonic solution are the solute outside the cell is lower than the inside, water moves from low to high, the cell swells, and eventually will burst. That's going to swell and swell and then burst.
So what happens then when we infuse different types of solutions into the patient's vein? So an infusion of an isotonic solution in the vein is going to cause no fluid movement in or out of the vasculature. So let's say that you're dehydrated. Well, the physician's probably going to order for you some normal saline. That's an isotonic solution. There will be no movement of fluid in or out of the vein. The fluid is designed to stay in the vasculature and increase the amount of vascular, vascular fluid that's available. An infusion of hypertonic solution into the vein is going to cause a movement of fluid from the tissues into the veins. And then thirdly, an infusion of a hypotonic solution in the veins causes fluid movement out of the veins and into the tissues. This would be good if we want to try and rehydrate the tissues of the patient's body. What this diagram here is illustrating are the differences between plasma interstitial fluid and intracellular skeletal muscle. This is interesting. It's not on the exam. Don't worry about memorizing this. But I just want to show you, give you some kind of representation as to how much of each thing happens to be in the plasma, the interstitial fluid, etc. Uh, the one that I think is particularly interesting is the plasma. So the plasma has most of the positive ion in the plasma is going to be sodium. Very little bit of potassium in there as well. Look over on the right side of it and you see that the vast majority of negative ion, anion, is going to be chloride, a little bit of bicarb, and a little bit of protein anions. Water excess occurs when the patient has too much fluid intake or they're not able to get rid of the fluid that they have on board. So our compensatory mechanisms are no longer able to excrete all the excess fluid and the extracellular fluid volume increases. So this could be caused by a clinical manifestation of a disease such as kidney disease or by an increased secretion of ADH where we have an excess of water on board. That particular syndrome is called SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. And we are going to talk more about that with endocrine. Decreased blood flow to the kidneys and decreased cardiac output could also be signs of water excess. Excessive secretion of ADH from fear of pain, acute infections, etc., uh, can cause the patient to also develop a water excess. So what would we expect to see in our lab values as far as our hemoglobin, our hematocrit, and our serum plasma osmolality? Remember, whenever you see the term osmolality, always think of concentration. So here we're talking about what would the serum plasma concentration be if the patient had water excess? What would these values be, increased or decreased? Well, if you said decreased, you'd be right. Okay, think about it this way. If we have water excess, we have too much water on board, that means we've diluted this stuff too much. Water excess will cause the patient to develop edema. This is an example of edema in the patient's ankle and foot. In other words, edema is swelling. But we're talking about a specific kind of swelling. This is the kind of swelling that is going to occur in a specific body area as a result of having too much fluid on board. So it would probably be in both ankles. It's going to be in an area that's dependent. In other words, that means it's lower than the rest of the body. Edema is an accumulation of fluid within the interstitial spaces. It's usually going to be caused by an increase in hydrostatic pressure. That means there's too much pressure in the blood vessel. It could also be caused by an oncotic or osmotic pressure that's pulling fluid out of the vasculature into the tissues. This is what your hypotonic solution does when we infuse it. An increase in capillary permeability will allow fluid out and cause edema, or lymph obstruction or leakage could cause the patient to develop edema. There's a number of th things then that can cause the water movement to change or to happen between our different compartments, the intracellular and extracellular fluid. So we have osmolality. And again, whenever you hear the term osmolality, always think of concentration. So the concentration of the vasculature, the plasma, versus the concentration of the tissue itself. Onconic or osmotic force. Osmotic force, again, refers to concentrations, concentrations of solutes in the fluid. Then we have net filtration. Filtration is the difference between our oncotic and our hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the amount of blood pressure in the vessel.
fluid may move freely in the body between these different compartments, but it will probably depend upon filtration, osmosis, hydrostatic pressure, or osmotic pressures within the different compartments to move that fluid. Proteins and electrolytes contribute to our osmotic pressure. So maintaining our fluids and our proteins and electrolytes will be very important if we want to try to maintain our patient's fluid volume status. Hydrostatic pressure is the push force. Osmotic pressure is the pull. Hydrostatic pressure is the push force of cardiac output and blood pressure. Osmotic pressure is the pull force of those electrolytes or those solutes in the tissue making a higher concentration. A couple components here, a very busy slide. I know there's a lot of stuff going on here, but basically we have the arterial end of the capillary and the venous end of the capillary. At the arterial end of the capillary, we're delivering our nutrients to those tissues. On the venous end, we're starting to pull those waste products out of the tissues and take them back and get rid of them. Any excess fluid or protein that happens to be sitting around in the interstitial compartment will be returned to the lymphatic system and the lymphatic system then drains that fluid back into the central circulation. Now what this slide is illustrating is some of the movements that occur with fluid in the body. We have our capillary fluid pressures, so that's our hydrostatic pressure. You see the hydrostatic capillary hydrostatic pressure is pushing the fluid out. We can have filtration, we can have oncotic pressure helping to reabsorb some of the things back into the vasculature. Uh, we can have intracellular osmotic pressure that is also helping to move fluid in and out of the cell. And then our lymphatic strains it away. I like this next picture because it gives you an idea as to what's happening with the pressures in the capillary. So we're way down at the capillary level there. And if you look at the hydrostatic pressure, it's saying the hydrostatic pressure is about 35. So I, what we're talking about here literally is the blood pressure. So when you take your blood pressure out there in your arm and you find out you have a blood pressure 120 over 80, that's what the blood pressure is up there in your arm. But by the time we get all the way down to the tissue, tissue that's being perfused, the hydrostatic pressure is going to only be about 35 millimeters of mercury. Now notice over there on the arterial end, our oncotic pressure is delivering about 25 millimeters of mercury force, whereas the hydrostatic pressure is delivering 35. In other words, the pressure in the vessel is 35, pressure outside is 25. Therefore, the net movement is more likely to move out rather than in. When we move over to the right side of the diagram, notice the oncotic pressure now is going to be 25, whereas the hydrostatic pressure is down to 17, which makes the venous end more likely that it's going to be pushing our waste products back into that vasculature. So the net movement, there's more pressure on the outside than the inside. Therefore, the waste products get pushed into that capillary, hopefully to be excreted from the body. So here's some of our normal lab values for some of our labs that we have to look at in relationship to our fluid and electrolytes. Our serum sodium or serum osmolality. The osmolality is the concentration of the blood. So that's going to be between about 280 and 300. Serum sodium, usually we say 135 to 145. Okay, again, some reference values are a little bit higher or lower. Normal hemoglobin is 12 to 17. Normal hematocrit is 36 to 54. And then our normal urine-specific gravity is 1.005 to 1.030. One of the mechanisms that controls fluid balance is ADH, that's antidiuretic hormone. And one way to remember the fact of what it's doing is to think about that H on the end there, it holds urine. It's a hormone of the pituitary. So the pituitary is stimulating the release of ADH, also called vasopressin, and it regulates the water balance. So it tells the kidneys to hold on or reabsorb sodium and water. Of course, if it holds sodium, that means it's going to hold water and slows down our diuresis so the patient is not diuresing as much. That means that the patient's going to hang on to fluid. ADH is going to be stimulated by having a low sodium level in the bloodstream, so we're trying to hang on to sodium and keep the sodium level up. It's going to be stimulated by a low blood volume, a low body fluid, so in other words, dehydration. So whenever the patient starts to become a little dehydrated, ADH is released and tells the body to hang on to fluid.
Well, we can have situations where we have ADH that's kind of out of control, and that's called the syndrome of inappropriate ADH. So there's too much, or another way to think about this is the inappropriate release of ADH. There's too much ADH being released into the bloodstream, and that's going to cause the patient to hang on to too much fluid. The primary cause for having SIADH is going to be neurologic. So look for the neurologic problem in your patient if you're thinking this could be SIADH that's occurring. So one of the keys in a test question or in a patient that you're caring for would be to look for the underlying neurological disorder. So we're going to look for the neuro disorder, stroke for example, or maybe brain trauma or a bleed or something like that that's occurring in the brain. As far as some of these other etiologies, cancers, AIDS, lung problems, etc., yes, those can cause SIADH much less common. The more common reason why somebody's going to have SIADH is going to be a neurologic dysfunction. When you look at the manifestations, these are all manifestations of having too much water on board. Water retention, edema formation, all that kind of stuff is going to be the result of having too much water on board. Look at one of the manifestations here though, dilutional hyponatremia. Okay, let's take a look at what that word means. Hyponatremia means a low sodium level in the bloodstream. And this is dilutional. So we have the same amount of sodium we did before. But the problem causing the low concentration of sodium in the blood is going to be that we have too much fluid. So we're diluting our sodium, and now the concentration of sodium in the bloodstream becomes less. That's a dilutional hyponatremia. Lab values for a patient who has SIADH. So let's take a look at these and talk about are they going to be increased or decreased? So if the patient is hanging on to too much fluid, what's going to happen to our serum osmolality? Remember, osmolality is concentration. So if we're hanging on to too much fluid, the concentration will go down. It'll be diluted. We'll have more fluid on board as opposed to our serum sodium will also go down because we're diluting it out. Hemoglobin hematocrit will fall because there are measures uh, in relationship to the amount of volume we have. And then lastly, our urine specific gravity will increase. Now the urine specific gravity tells us the concentration of our urine. Remember that ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is keeping the patient from diuresing. In other words, it's decreasing the amount of urine output that the patient has, and therefore the urine is going to become more concentrated. And a concentrated urine has a higher specific gravity. Now let's take a look at and compare the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone and diabetes insipidus. These are two conditions of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, but they're opposites of each other. SIADH is from too much antidiuretic hormone, whereas diabetes insipidus is from a lack of ADH. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about diabetes insipidus a little bit later when we get into a, uh, our low volume states. So fluid volume Excess results in either losing or retention of fluid in the body. So what do you think the correct answer here would be? Fluid volume excess, hanging on to too much fluid, causes the retention of fluid in the body. Just as in a fluid volume deficit, the electrolytes are out of balance when there's a fluid volume excess. As a consequence, fluid moves from the extracellular compartment into the cell, and cells will swell or shrink. Cells will swell if fluid is moving from the extracellular compartment into the cell. As the secretion of ADH increases, the excretion of urine blank. So what do you think? 
As the secretion of ADH increases, the excretion of urine decreases. Again, remember, ADH is anti-diuretic hormone. That means if the patient has it, they're not diuresing. If the patient lacks it, they will be diuresing. So it's kind of like a double negative there. If they lack anti, then they will be diuresing. Which of the following may indicate a fluid volume excess? Warm, moist skin, cool, dry skin, mental confusion, loss of weight, convulsions, and why? So depending upon the etiology for having the fluid volume excess, we may have warm, moist skin. We may have cool, dry skin. Mental confusion is going to occur as a result of having a low sodium level. We're not going to have a loss of weight with a fluid volume excess. In fact, we will gain weight. Convulsions are possible because as the sodium level goes down, we're going to have changes occurring in the patient's mental status. Okay, now the opposite problem then would be a water deficit. So the patient's dehydrated. We don't have enough water on board. And of course, there's mechanisms in place in the body to try to prevent this. Obviously, the most common mechanism that we use is going to be the kidneys. The kidneys themselves are going to kick in and they're going to say, hey, let's hang on to fluid because this patient is becoming dehydrated. So the manifestations we could expect to see with a water deficit or with dehydration would be tachycardia, weak pulses, and postural hypotension. These are all signs of a low cardiac output state. So as the volume decreases, there's not as much volume to pump and our cardiac output goes down, which then causes these compensatory mechanisms to be demonstrated. Our flushed dry skin might be possible. We can also see dry mucous membranes. Our urine output goes down okay, because the kidneys start trying to hang on to fluid. The hematocrit and the serum sodium levels will then go up. So there's three main types of dehydration. We get an isotonic dehydration where we're losing just as much electrolyte as we are fluid. And that's going to be a common type that we see with our extracellular compartment. Hypotonic type of dehydration where we have a greater deficit of our electrolytes and then the fluid that is being lost. We might see this with somebody who has vomiting. So we might end up with that kind of a situation where they're losing electrolytes from the vomiting. Hypertonic, where we have a greater deficit of fluid rather than electrolytes. So we're having more fluid loss than electrolytes being lost. And that can cause some severe problems for our patient as well. So it could be one of these three different types. So if our patient's dehydrated, we can't assume it's just going to be isotonic. We have to check those electrolytes and find out where the patient's at so we know what to replace. Do we need to just replace the fluid? Do we need to replace the electrolytes as well? When a patient has a water deficit, in other words, the patient's dehydrated, what would we expect to see in these lab values? So the serum plasma osmolarity, okay, so again, osmolarity is concentration. So our concentration in our serum will go up when we have a water deficit. There's not as much water. There's not as much fluid to dilute it. Serum sodium will go up because there's not as much fluid to dilute it. Our hemoglobin hematocrit will go up as well. Our urine-specific gravity should also go up because the kidneys should be hanging on to fluid to try to retain our fluid volume. Now diabetes insipidus is the opposite problem of SIADH. In SIADH we produced too much antidiuretic hormone. Now in, S, in diabetes insipidus on the other hand we are producing too little antidiuretic hormone. Two main causes, this could be neurologic, and that's where most of this comes from, but could also be that the kidneys are not responsive to the ADH that is being produced. So it could come from two different mechanisms. Usually it's going to be a neurologic mechanism. So the patient cannot concentrate their urine, and they're losing lots and lots of dilute urine.
which means the patient's going to become dehydrated. The patient, let's go down and take a look at these manifestations. Polydipsia is that the patient wants to keep drinking. So they feel dehydrated. They want to keep drinking. They have polyuria, which means their urine output is very high. Again, not enough antidiuretic hormone. If there's not enough antidiuretic hormone, that means that the person's going to be diuresing. Tachycardia, hypotension, dry skin, these are all things related to being dehydrated. Neurologic symptoms, okay, so lots of signs and symptoms of having diabetes insipidus. Again, we just talked about some of these in relationship to having a volume deficit. They'll be similar, maybe, in our patient who has diabetes insipidus. Let's see how they're different. Our serum osmolality, the patient has is losing too much fluid. So the serum osmolality will be high, right? The serum concentration will be high because the patient's losing lots of fluid. The serum sodium will be high because the patient's losing lots of fluid. Hemoglobin hematocrit will be high because the patient's losing lots of fluid. But in diabetes insipidus, the urine-specific gravity will be low. Okay, now that didn't make sense with a volume deficit, a water deficit. We said with a water deficit, the urine-specific gravity is supposed to be high as a result of the kidneys hanging onto fluid and trying to decrease the urine output so that the patient can hang on to every drop of fluid that they have in the body. But instead, what happens in diabetes insipidus is we have a lack of anti-diuretic hormone. So the patient's diuresing inappropriately. And they're having all of this dilute urine spilling out when it shouldn't be. So here's our normal lab values again. Let's take a look at some case studies here uh, talking about a patient with diabetes insipidus. So here we have Mr. Aqua. Mr. Aqua has polyuria with a urine volume of 8 liters a day. That's a lot of urine volume. Think about that for yourself. I mean, you know, that's a lot of urine volume there. Urine specific gravity is 1.002. Normal urine specific gravity is anywhere from 1.005 to 1.030. Big range. Okay, because urine specific gravity can change as you go throughout your day. You know, you didn't drink a whole lot of fluid this morning. Maybe your urine's a little bit more concentrated than it is this afternoon. But certainly 1.002 is less than the normal range. Serum sodium in this case, Mr. Aqua has a serum sodium of 150. Normal is 135 to 145. Plasma osmolality is 305, normal is up to 300. So those values are both high. The sodium and the osmolality, the concentration, are both high, while his urine-specific gravity is low. Those things don't fit together. The normal presentation of your patient, high serum sodium, high plasma osmolality, would indicate dehydration. And with dehydration, we should have a high urine-specific gravity. The concentration of the urine should be high. We should have concentrated urine. Instead, we have dilute urine. That doesn't fit with dehydration. So when the urine doesn't fit with the serum sodium, then we have to think about these alternate kind of problems such as diabetes insipidus and SIADH. So what type of hormonal alteration might Mr. Aqua be exhibiting? Well, in this case, it's diabetes insipidus. Possible causes? Probably, I would have to say, we're looking for a neurologic cause for this condition. The urine-specific gravity, we did talk about the pathophysiology already. The specific gravity is low because the patient's producing lots of dilute urine. The serum sodium and serum osmolality are high because the patient is dumping lots of volume and concentrating their serum. Ms. Jane, 85, has a small bowel obstruction caused by adhesions from a previous surgery. Over the past three hours, her nasogastric tube has drained 1,200 milliliters of a brownish fecal-smelling fluid. This is common in a small bowel obstruction. Ms. Jane has been vomiting before coming to the hospital for the past three hours. Her urine output has totaled 50 mLs of concentrated urine. Okay, now, just so that you know because you probably haven't received this information yet, a normal urine output should be 30 milliliters per hour. So her urine output should be at least bare minimum of 90 for the past three hours, 30 per hour. But hers is only 50. 
Her vital signs are her pulse is 100, her blood pressure is 105 over 50, respiration is 24, her temperature is 99, so a little bit in normal temperature is 98.5. Here, she is confused and restless. She's getting an infusion of sodium chloride at 100 milliliters an hour. These signs or symptoms indicate which? Hypovolemia or hypervolemia? So let's go back and take a look at some of her information again. She's drained out 1,200 milliliters of fluid from her nasogastric tube. This is a tube that goes in the, tu the nose, goes down into the stomach, and is draining fluid out of the stomach. So she's lost 1,200 milliliters. Okay, so that's a liter, or a little over a liter, okay, a pretty significant amount of fluid, from her stomach. Now also, for the past few days she's had vomiting before she came into the hospital so first of all she's not taking fluid in by way of the mouth she's losing fluid by way of her nasogastric tube and vomiting now we see signs that her urine output is low okay, indicating that she's probably not doesn't have enough fluid on board when you don't have enough fluid in your body your urine output goes down in order to try to maintain the volume that you do have her pulse is a little bit high at 100. Her blood pressure is a little bit low. So these could all be signs that she has a fluid volume deficit, or in other words, hypovolemia. Which of the following patients are likely to need additional fluid? So let's take a look at our list here. Confused patients. Well, confused patients may need additional fluid because they may be dehydrated, and that's what's causing their confusion. Certainly, there would be, we'd need to do a lot more workup. We'd need to do, get a lot more information before we just give a confused patient fluid. Okay, so that could be a cause, but isn't necessarily the cause of the patient's confusion, so we can't just give them fluid assuming that their confusion is caused by a lack of fluid. Very ill patients oftentimes will need fluid. However, some very ill patients, like patients with heart failure, giving them fluid is going to make them sicker. So that is another situation where we're going to have to look at the patient's situation and scenario to be able to decide whether or not they need fluid. But certainly very ill patients typically need more fluid than other, other patients will. Patients with an elevated temperature will need more fluid. Remember, we lose fluid through the skin. And in fact, if that patient's temperature goes up, they're going to start to lose more fluid, both through the skin and through respiration. Remember, the body, as the temperature goes up, the body's going to try and compensate and get the temperature back down again by increasing respiration and by losing more fluid through the skin, causing vasodilation, etc. So we have an increase in our loss through the skin. Patients with, patients with a tracheostomy may need more fluid because the upper airway helps to humidify the air that's going into the lung, and we just bypass that by putting in a tracheostomy. Burn patients need fluid. Infants, okay, remember again, they have a large amount of body mass that's going to be fluid, and if they lose even 10% of that, they could really be in trouble. And the patients with cerebral injury may have fluid volume problems related to diabetes insipidus. Electrolytes are going to be elements that are dissolved in a solution. And in the body, we're talking about elements that are going to be required for body functions. Some of the physiologic processes that electrolytes help to maintain are going to be the promotion of neuromuscular impulses, a maintenance of our body fluid osmolality, regulation of our acid-base balance, of course, and distribution of body fluids and electrolytes between the different compartments in the body. The fluid of each of one of our compartments contains electrolytes, and in many cases, the amount of electrolyte in one compartment is not going to be the same as the amount in other compartments. When one moves out of the cell, another will have to come in to take its place. For example, the sodium-potassium pump. When potassium is pumped into the cell, sodium is going to have to leave the cell. Otherwise, we're going to have too much positive ion inside the cell. So there's going to be some transaction occurring in order to move electrolytes around in the body. The first electrolyte we're going to talk about is sodium. And sodium is the primary extracellular fluid cation. In other words, the primary extracellular fluid positively charged ion. It regulates our osmotic forces. Osmosis is concerned with moving fluid. 
Osmosis is concerned with moving fluid. So osmosis is moving fluid in the body. The function of sodium in the body is to move fluid, to make sure that we have fluid where we need it in different areas of the body, and to get rid of fluid. If we have too much fluid on board, sodium will be dumped through the kidneys, fluid will follow it, and the patient will get rid of that extra fluid. If the patient is dehydrated, the body will hang on to sodium in an attempt to also hang on to fluid. So the roles of sodium in the body include neuromuscular irritability or activity, acid-base balance, okay, because it usually binds up with chloride, cellular chemical reactions, and membrane transport. So now let's take a look at some problems that occur with sodium levels. So first of all, hypernatremia. In hypernatremia, we have a serum sodium that is greater than our upper level, uh, whether that be 145, 147 is listed here, but our upper level of our normal values. Related to sodium gain or water loss, water movement from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid, which can happen with intracellular dehydration. Clinical signs and symptoms include intracellular dehydration. So we're dehydrating our cells. That's not a good thing if this is a brain cell we're talking about. Convulsions, pulmonary edema, hypotension, tachycardia, lots and lots of problems associated with hypernatremia. Now the problem with hypernatremia, the problem that causes hypernatremia is a lack of fluid. Rarely is it the situation where the patient has too much sodium on board. Usually it's a situation where the patient has too little fluid on board. So the treatment is going to be to give fluid to the patient. What it's showing here is the outside lining or the, the outer blue circle around these cells is the size that the cell should be before it started to shrink as a result of our hypernatremic environment. So there's so much sodium in the external environment around the cell, the cell starts to shrivel up because water from the cell is being given off into the tissues. Hyponatremia, on the other hand, is having a serum sodium less than 135. In this case, we have too much water on board. So a low sodium level is not a situation where the patient necessarily needs sodium, but in fact, instead is a situation where the patient has too much fluid on board. This can happen in a number of different ways. This can happen from the patient being in the hospital, we're giving too much IV fluid. This could also happen because the person is drinking too much water. A very common situation used to be when people would run a long race, they would have water stations. And as the person is running, they're losing both sodium and water in the sweat. Then they're replacing just the water at the water stations, and people would end up having hyponatremia by the end of the race. So now at most long races, they have something like Gatorade that contains sodium. So we're replacing both sodium and water during that race. In this case here, uh, the inner kind of dotted line there is going to be the size that the cell should be. Now that the patient has hyponatremia, there's too much water on outside of the cell. The water is going to leak into the cell and make the cell swell. Now eventually the cell is going to become so big like a balloon, it will pop and will have cell death. So that's not going to be a good thing. Again, again, we're just talking about random ordinary cells here. But what if these cells happen to be cells of the brain? Now you see that could be a really bad situation if we're having swelling of the brain tissue. Chloride is a very abundant anion in the extracellular fluid. Okay, anions, remember, are negatively charged electrolytes, it moves in and out of cells with sodium. So chloride usually binds up with sodium. We find those two things together. The primary function of chloride is to maintain our acid-base balance in the body. So a low chloride level could be caused by the patient having a loss through the GI system or excessive sweating. Remember, it's going to kind of move along there with sodium. It could be from a sodium or potassium deficiency that's causing the patient to develop a low chloride level. A high chloride level could happen if we have a high sodium level. Remember, those two things tend to go hand in hand. But chloride's main function in the body is going to be to maintain our acid-base balance. So these changes in chloride is not just a matter of, hey, it's just tagging along with sodium, not doing anything. It's tagging along with sodium and could be causing problems with our acid-base balance. Potassium, on the other hand, is the major intracellular cation, the positive ion inside the cell, and it's going to regulate our intracellular fluid volume. So it's responsible for the fluid volume and the pH balance inside the cell. 
Potassium is very important for having a membrane potential and the ability of the cell to be able to conduct electricity, so nerve conduction, contraction of muscles, especially those cardiac muscle cells and metabolic processes. So obviously we need to have enough potassium in the body, very narrow range of our normal potassium, 3.5 to 5. So we have a narrow range, which is our normal range for potassium. We don't want it going outside of that range because then we're going to have problems with nerve conduction, contraction of, cardio of muscles like our heart. Okay, So that could cause some real serious problems with our patients being able to function. We lose about 40 to 80 milliequivalents of potassium every day just via the kidneys, just normal process falling out in the urine. So we're going to have to replace that. Our patients are going to need 40 to 80 milliequivalents of potassium coming into the diet every single day. Now, we're not talking about somebody who's on diuretics. We're not talking about somebody who has an excessive amount of fluid loss. We're talking about your average everyday patient needs to get in 40 milliequivalents per day. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll add that 40 milliequivalents of potassium to the IV bag if the patient's getting a regular IV. Some things that could interfere with or impact our potassium levels could be renal failure, where the patient is no longer able to get rid of the potassium that we take in in the diet, and then potassium levels could start to rise. Changes in pH will also affect our potassium balance. Now, a low potassium level is considered to be a level that's less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. And you can see some of the causes and some of the symptoms listed here, lots of different causes of hypokalemia. But we lose a lot of our electrolytes through the upper GI tract, so the patient vomiting, etc. cetera. Uh, we can also lose th some through diarrhea. Uh, potassium is one of those electrolytes that we're likely to be able to lose through the urinary tract. So patients who are taking diuretics have a real affinity for losing their potassium. Lots of symptoms and when you're looking at your electrolytes look for symptoms to occur in three major areas of the body the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the heart. So when we're looking at those three major areas the central nervous system we have anorexia, nausea, fatigue, and muscle weakness and then the peripheral nervous system we have paresthesias. Paresthesias are changes in sensation. It's not a loss of sensation, it's a change in sensation. And then on a heart we're going to see cardiac dysrhythmias that can progress to cardiac arrest. And in fact we can even see EKG changes. The EKG change we see in hypokalemia is going to be a shallow flattened out T wave. We may also see an additional wave on our EKG that's called a U wave. You're going to get into more in analyzing EKGs later on in your program. Hyperkalemia, on the other hand, is a situation where we have too much potassium on board. This is going to be causing increased neuromuscular irritability, and the patient can have a lot of symptoms here uh, that are going to be untoward. So let's take a look at some of those. So causes renal failure is going to be the number one cause for having hyperkalemia. If your patient has hyperkalemia, the number one thing we're going to look for is renal dysfunction in the patient. There could be some other things that are causing it, but primarily the primary one is going to be renal failure. Now, if we go and look for our symptoms in the three main areas here, we would be looking for the central nervous system, nausea, fatigue, peripheral nervous system, paresthesias, muscle weakness to paralysis, and in the heart, cardiac dysrhythmias. As far as our EKG goes with hyperkalemia, we see tall peaked T waves as opposed to having that flattened out T wave that we saw with hypokalemia. Calcium is a major, not the major, but a major extracellular cation. So calcium is a positively charged ion that is in the extracellular fluid. Structure of the bones and teeth. In fact, 98% of the body's calcium is found in the bone. So we have a huge amount of our calcium sitting out there in the bone. It's needed for muscle contraction and relaxation. This is the funny thing about calcium. We need calcium to contract the heart muscle. <laughs> if we have too much calcium we're not going to contract our skeletal muscles. So it has like an opposite effect on the heart versus the skeletal muscle. Calcium is also necessary for clotting and is involved in the clotting cascade in at least three or four different places. So it's multiple places in a clotting cascade that calcium is necessary in order for a clot to form. Hormone secretion, cell receptor functions, and membrane stabilization are all necessary that we have calcium available.
Calcium is controlled by the parathyroid hormone. Also, vitamin D and calcitonin will regulate how much calcium is going to be absorbed in the body. Lastly, we see here that we have an inverse relationship of calcium and phosphorus. What this means is that if the phosphorus level is high, then the calcium level will be low, and vice versa. If the phosphorus level is low, the calcium level will be high. They're inversely related. So if we see that somebody has a low calcium level, one of the first things we want to do is to go back and look at and see what their phosphorus level is, and maybe that's the culprit causing the problem. So here's a number of different causes of hypercalcemia. The primary reason why somebody would have hypercalcemia would be that we have a loss of calcium from the bone. So this could be a cancer, a neoplasm. This could be a, a situation of bone metabolism abnormalities. Paget's disease is a disease of bone metabolism where too much calcium is being released from the bone. Symptoms, we're going to see depressed neuromuscular activity, in other words, muscle weakness, loss of muscle tone, lethargy, anorexia, nausea, there's your central nervous system, and in the heart, cardiac dysrhythmias. So we could expect to see those kind of things with a high calcium level. Low calcium levels, and you see a number of reasons why we would have that there. Now, I previously mentioned that calcium is stored in the bone. In fact, 98% of our body's calcium is in a bone. So in order to get calcium into the bloodstream, we have to have some mechanism that allows it out. And the gatekeeper is parathyroid hormone. Now, once calcium is out in the bloodstream, something needs to keep it there. And what keeps the calcium in the bloodstream is albumin. The primary reason for having a low calcium will be a low albumin. The primary reason for having a low calcium will be a low albumin. Look at the patient's albumin level. Look at the patient's nutrition. Albumin is a protein. And if the patient's not eating, they're not going to have enough protein and they're not going to have an adequate albumin level. Therefore, they won't have an adequate calcium level. So opposite of what we saw with hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia has increased neuromuscular stimulation, muscle spasms, cramps, and dysrhythmias. There's your, your cardiac part of it. Shostak sign and Trousseau sign are specific signs that we use to tell us about neuromuscular irritability in patients who have some kind of electrolyte disorder. You will learn more about these in your health assessment class, but Shostak sign is a tapping of the facial nerve that is going to cause the upper, the eyebrow and the upper lip to twitch if the patient has neuromuscular irritability. Trousseau sign is a little bit more barbaric. What we do with that is we put a blood pressure cuff on the patient, blow it up to 10 millimeters of mercury above their systolic and leave it on for five minutes. A positive Trousseau sign is the hand and arm curl up as a result of neuromuscular irritability when the patient has that lack of blood flow to the arm. They're probably going to smack you instead because that would be pretty uncomfortable having a blood pressure cuff on for five minutes. Well, thank you for joining me for part one of fluid and electrolytes. Let's move on to part two now and talk about the rest of our electrolytes and look at some practice questions relating to fluids and electrolytes.